Hey, everybody, we're just on the verge of the eclipse here, but we're, we're working through it. And we have a great guest today who is, is transforming the world of mobility and transportation with uh, Icomera, with Gabriel. How are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. How about you, Evan? I'm doing well, and, and thanks so much for being here. Uh, I'm a big fan of public transportation, trains and trams and trolleys. In, in Europe, and I'm really fascinated to talk about the future of mobility in regards to communications and customer experience and broadband, something you know a lot about. Maybe you could introduce yourself and your mission at Icomera. Yeah, happy to. Uh, so I'm, I'm Gabriel Lopez Bernal. I'm the president of Icomera here in North America. We are the world's leading provider of integrated connectivity solutions uh, for public transport. Um, in short, what that means is we provide um, home level, you know, the, the type of Internet quality that you could experience in, in a terrestrial environment in your building. Uh, we do it on buses and trains and, and ferries all around the world. Um, and our job is to make sure that we're providing a robust Internet connection for a variety of different purposes uh, for people while they're on the go. Well, it's a really intriguing topic and something uh, a common complaint of mine whenever I'm on public transport in its various forms. So for someone who's not in the industry, is not an industry insider, you know, how do you describe uh, what you do and how you do it? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's a difficult concept, I think, for certain people to, to understand. You know, Wi-Fi is ubiquitous. It is, mm. it is you, you can get it at the cafe, you get it at, 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 at the Marriott, uh, you get it obviously at your home off your router, but all those systems work in a, in a very similar way. You're plugging into an Ethernet cable that has at least a gigabit or, or probably more um, bandwidth available to you. And as long as you have a router that can distribute that kind of signal, you're gonna have a, a good internet connection over that Wi-Fi network. In a mobile environment, slightly different. Obviously you don't have an ethernet cable chasing your train down the tracks. Uh, so you're going to be aggregating connectivity from a variety of different sources. Uh, and that's that's really our bread and butter at Akamera. We have a, a patent on several algorithms and, and different technologies that allow us to aggregate that bandwidth down to that train in a very efficient way. Uh, so we're gonna be using cellular connections, you know, an LTE or 5G connection from a couple of different sources. It could be satellite, it could be, you know, Vogue topic today are these LEO satellites that are being launched. Uh, so we're connecting with those satellites. It could be a private network. It could be a, a Wi-Fi network at a station. Uh, it really doesn't matter to us. That's the beauty of our technology is that it's agnostic. So we're going to be leveraging all that connectivity, communicating with all these different uh, networks and systems in real time, and choosing the right ones for the applications and the demand that we have in real time to make sure that you have a consistent connection across that entire journey. Fantastic mission. And obviously, the benefits to passengers are, are pretty clear, but you also talk about making transportation safer and smarter. Uh, yeah. So I assume that you're connecting lots of things, not just people. Uh, exactly. How does that work exactly? Yeah, so it's a connected world. I mean, every system today, I mean, your, your microwave at home may be connected to the Internet, which you may or may not want. I'll leave that to you to decide. But every system today, yes, is connected to, to the Internet, and it has a heartbeat. It's got to check in and make sure that that system is operating uh, as intended. Uh, in the past, you would find our buses and our trains would be equipped with a variety of different onboard communication systems. And what we're doing is we're integrating those to a single platform and using it again, using that aggregated connectivity uh, to provide a more robust connection uh, to that vehicle. And we're connecting video surveillance systems so that police and emergency personnel can see what's happening in real time. We're connecting CAD AVL systems, so things that help the, the agencies operate and uh, deliver services uh, on time. Uh, passenger information system so that if there is a delay, the agency can communicate with you in real time, let you know what's what's going on. Uh, information is key. And what we do is we make sure that we move that information to and from the vehicle at the right time. Uh, so it might be in real time as the vehicle is traveling, or it might not be as urgent. And it might be something that can wait till the end of the service day. And in which case we backhaul that data into the cloud uh, once the vehicle is parked safely in the yard or, or somewhere where it's non-essential. Wow, fantastic uh, example. Uh, and tell us about your personal career journey. You you, uh, you studied engineering and then advanced studies in uh, urban planning. So yeah. You clearly have a passion for this space. Yeah. Um, tell us about that that story and your you know your current role. Yeah, thank you. So uh, 
started a uh, undergrad as a civil engineer, uh, mm -hmm. really interested in, in bridges and tunnels and, and, and really our cities and what, what makes cities work. Um, from civil engineering school, encouraged to go into, into a master's in urban planning, spent uh, some of my best years of my life up there in, in Boston, uh, studying at Tufts University, got a master's in urban planning and really understanding how policy shapes cities and shapes, you know, the world that we live in. Um, and from there, really spun into technology. Uh, really, it's what captured my attention and, and my eye. Um, started my career cutting my teeth out at the US DOT, right, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the Volpe Center, mm. working on some some really cool projects. There was a uh, an initiative called the Connected Vehicle Project, uh, using short-range communication for vehicles to communicate with each other and communicate with infrastructure. And the intent of this was 40,000 plus people die on our roads every single year. How can we wow. use technology to reduce that number significantly and provide alerts to drivers so that they can take corrective measures before it's too late and before a collision actually occurs? Um, really, that's that's captured my attention as I'm, as I'm sure it captured yours there briefly. Um, but you know, I, I started looking at how can we use technology to better our lives and how can we use technology to improve the quality of the transit services that that are that we're delivering and recognizing that agencies have very limited funds so how do we really maximize their return on investment that's when i learned about this company icamera and here we're coming up on nine years that i've been with icamera uh, really helped them get started here in the united states and uh over the last couple of years taken over the full company and and overseeing all of our commercial interests in the united states and, and canada and making sure that we're bringing the connected journey uh, to agencies like the MBTA there in Boston, Amtrak, uh, Brightline Trains, Santa Clara Valley out in California, et cetera, making sure that we're bringing this connected journey uh, across the United States. Wonderful mission. Well, it's one of those, you know, train fans uh, out there. Uh, I, I certainly can appreciate what you're doing. I mean, the reality is we have a lot of budget constraints, uh, despite being a fan of the T, as we call it here in Boston. You know, we've seen the constraints there and the underinvestment over the years, some would say. Um, so how do you think about getting ROI or, you know, the best return on technology investments in systems like the T and others who, yeah. you know, seem to be underfunded, at least in the U.S. and many, many other places? Yeah. So, you know, investing in a technology, a platform like ours is making an investment in, in quality. And I think that's mm. that's the important first step. Um, when you buy a quality technology, um, like the, the products and services that we provide, you're going to get that long uh, return on it. The, the, the life cycle of this technology is such that an agency can sleep comfortably knowing that the investment on this is going to be at least five, but likely seven, or in other instances, more years. And that's fabulous to me. But the real ROI comes in integrating these onboard systems. We have a history and a pattern in the United States, especially of buying discrete uh, onboard systems. You know, we had the money, so we bought the video surveillance system. We had the money, so we bought, you know, the fare collection system or the PIS system. So agencies, for, for no fault of their own really, have gotten into this pattern where they've gone and bought discrete systems. Next thing you know, you have three, four, five routers, different communications devices on your bus, on your train. There's zero redundancy. And agencies are scratching their heads saying, there's got to be a better path. Uh, we provide that better path. We integrate all of those onboard services into one central communications platform, and we become the broker of that information in a far more reliable fashion to all of these different backend systems. The agency still has choice. They can still work with different vendors, but we become this integrator and, and in charge of channeling that communication to different backend systems that the agency needs to operate their vehicles. Well said. That's really powerful. Um, so of all the challenges the agencies have today, um, what's what's one or two that you feel are they're not paying enough attention to? Well, you know, it's, it is, um, you know, I think agencies need to look at uh, the, the total cost of ownership of any investment. Mm -hmm. I think agencies, especially today with, with the amount of, of money flowing from the federal government, get excited. And they go out and, and make a purchase. They make a big investment in some in rolling stock, for example, or, or new, new train cars. And they forget that those train cars are going to come with other onboard systems that they're going to have to own and operate for many years. And mm. what we encourage agencies to do is to decouple these things a bit. You're going to buy a great rail car. There's some great rail car manufacturers out there. 
but they're not the same organizations that you should be relying on for your technology decisions. You should handle that discussion somewhat separately and bring the two together as part of that procurement. When you do that, you guarantee that you're going to get best in breed on your rail car and your technology investment. So what we're encouraging agencies to do is to think about how do you get, how do you make an investment at, at that point that's going to last you seven, 10 years, much longer than it would if you're just simply relying on an OEM, a, a rail car manufacturer to recommend something to you. I think part of it is, you know, you go out and buy a, a Tesla or, or a Mercedes Benz and, and you count on that OEM to kind of give you the whole, the whole passenger experience. And I think agencies feel that in this space, when you're buying a bus or buying a train, hmm. the same thing applies. Unfortunately, that's not the case. These organizations are great. They make fabulous trains, fabulous buses. But when it comes to outfitting them with technology, that's not their bailiwick. That's not their specialty. And we encourage agencies to look at, look at these things uh, under their own lens and to make that investment separately and to drive the decision in the right direction that's going to allow that agency to succeed over many years. Well, wow, it's a great point. And we, we're not going to get into all the technology today, though I'd love to. I'm a total wireless tech geek. But maybe talk about some of your unique intellectual property and the technology yeah. around you know, networking. You have 5G technology. You have Wi-Fi 7 technology. There's a lot there under the hood. Uh, pun yeah, intended. there is. <laughs> yeah. And, and we pride ourselves on innovation here at Icomera. We mm -hmm. have a, a brilliant team over in Europe that that is the brainchild of a lot of our products. Our, our CTO is actually one of our company founders and, and he's still with us uh, today and that's mm. fabulous. Uh, but the company was started, uh, written uh, on, on an algorithm that was a link aggregation protocol. And it was designed to be agnostic and it was designed to basically work with any communications technology. Uh, that was in 1999. In 2001, we used that link aggregation protocol to provide the first broadband internet connection on a train. And we did that using an aggregated cellular connection. Uh, again, it being agnostic, and it's evolved over its over its uh, life. We're now in the fourth generation of this uh, protocol. It's called the Sherwan protocol. It can use any IP-based technology. So it, it really doesn't matter what the application is. We can find the right solution for our clients and make sure that they're going to get industry-leading connectivity, whether they're running trains in Florida, California, or all the way up to the Arctic Circle. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> We can use Sherwan to make sure that we're delivering the best possible connection for their operating environment. And then on the other side of it, we, we moved into the um, design and development of our own routers. So we don't buy commercial mm. off the shelf. We actually design and manufacture our own equipment. Um, and, and from there, we've sought to perfect uh, technologies in other areas. You mentioned Wi-Fi 7. Uh, we were proud last year to, to announce and, and unveil the world's first Wi-Fi 7 access point for, for rail. So this is a, wow. a, an incredible device. It is far ahead of its time, and it's going to bring industry-leading connectivity for many, many years to agencies that are beginning to make those investments in the Wi-Fi 7 um, access point. And then beyond that, we're moving into more operational areas. Um, a, a great example of this is our team and what we're developing uh, in, in the video surveillance space. We have mm -hmm. a, an AI platform that uses um, video cameras to detect certain behaviors on a train, count passengers, identify lost luggage, identify uh, at the front of the locomotive if there's vegetation intruding on the right of way. Some really cool things that we're doing here with the technology. Again, because we have a robust uh, communications platform uh, powering the whole thing, we can do a lot of things in real time for our transit agency partners. Wow, that, that's really exciting. And uh, I can't wait to see it in action as a passenger. Um, so you take a very long view of the future of tech and your roadmap. What, what sort of things are you most excited about over the next couple, three, five years even? Yeah, you, 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 the last one there really got me. It's, it's AI. You know, AI is mm. um, incredibly exciting. Um, it's, it has, in my opinion, the most transformative potential for transit agencies, um, especially those operating uh, rail systems. So with AI, we have this incredible ability, not necessarily to replace humans, you, you're going to need individuals monitoring this to, to verify and to take corrective measures, but really to, to look at data and to call events to your attention that warrant that, that human intervention. Uh, so things like intrusion detection. So if you have people mm -hmm. walking on a right-of-way as the train is approaching, 
Unfortunately, you know, we have a, a lot of train pedestrian collisions that happen in the United States. Mm. We can mitigate that if we had better AI monitoring uh, our, 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 our right of ways. Uh, on board the train, same thing. We could be monitoring for fights. We could be monitoring for weapons being brandished on the vehicle. Wow. There's a lot of really cool things that AI gives you the potential to do. And again, doesn't replace necessarily the humans, but it gives humans um, the actionable information that they need to then step in and take corrective measures. Uh, we talked about monitoring um, vegetation um, growing along a right of way. Uh, so it allows an agency to be more efficient, again, in, in its operations and more targeted when it goes out to do its maintenance of way. At the same time, we're also pointing a camera up to the to the overhead catenary and monitoring how that pantograph interacts with the overhead catenary. So there in, in Boston, the T is the oldest uh, subway in America. You have some 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 uh, some beautiful infrastructure, but it is it is obviously dated. We can monitor the way that the Green Line pantograph interacts with that catenary, so that the T knows when it needs to come out and do that preventative maintenance. It allows it to operate in a more efficient fashion. It allows you as a passenger to have a better experience because those trains are only going to be taken out of service or the right of way is only going to be shut down when absolutely necessary. So to me, AI is the future. Uh, you're hearing that likely in a lot of different industries at the same time. Um, but for transit, it has a lot of potential to really improve the passenger experience, improve the way an agency operates. And again, due to the limited funds that we have, drive new levels of efficiency to the organization, which is something that's become you know very near and dear to my heart is how do we help transit agencies extract maximum value out of their limited funds? Well, so well said, so important. Um, well, really interesting perspective. What, what are you excited about the next few weeks? You go to a lot of trade shows and events and I do. industry and, and meetings. At, <laughs> yeah, sorry, but I'm at one of the most exciting <laughs> ones actually here today. It's oh. APTA Legislative. So I'm here in Washington, D.C., um, you have a gathering of all the top, you know, CEOs from around the country. Uh, you have uh, all your policymakers here on Capitol Hill and everybody's getting together. And we're talking about really the future. You have monumental investments happening thanks to the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. The, the dollars mm -hmm. are flowing and you're starting to see we're going to start seeing as, as the public the benefits of these policies and, and of these changes. So it's a it's a it's one of the most exciting times to be in the transit industry. Uh, in the United States, historic levels of funding, just incredible actions being taken. Um, and, and you're just seeing some really cool projects starting to get underway that are going to be transformative for, for this for this country for many years to come. Well, I'm really excited for that. And I can't wait to see all this uh, value being rolled out uh, as a passenger and industry observer. Thanks so much. I'll let you get back to the big week. Um, and, uh, you know, everyone reach out and follow the content from Ike O'Mara. Really interesting, informative content, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Really good stuff. Thanks for joining, Gabriel. Thank you, Evan. It was uh, my pleasure. Take care. Thanks, everyone. And uh, enjoy the getting dark here. Enjoy the eclipse. Bye-bye.